to the worship of the Main Street Church of Christ. We're an inner city congregation dedicated to feeding the poor and homeless and, and um, uh, preaching the gospel to the whole wide world. So there's just uh, not a greater work and we're very thankful for it. We wanna, uh, we'll be back probably studying Acts next week, the Lord willing. We're gonna finish up now. We've been studying our servant passages and what's more apropos than to study about how Christ was a servant and how we have practiced it these holiday uh, these, these these holidays that we've just had. We've uh, we three weeks ago we gave out a whole truckload of uh, clothes out here on the parking lot with Greenville Avenue congregation and the Siegelville congregation came and brought. Uh, uh, food for the poor and ha hygiene packs and stuff like that. And the ability to give away socks and, and, and uh, 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 hygiene packets and, and blankets and stuff. You know, as I said in my prayer, someone froze to death on this parking lot every year for 20 some odd years until last year. Every year somebody gets out here and freezes to death and so uh, uh, Brother Sinclair brought us, bought us 400 blankets and, and we have been able to take care of the homeless and stuff with blankets. Amen. And so we're very thankful for that. We've, uh, most of the people in the homeless people are still under those blankets because it's below 30, still below 30 out there, I believe. If, uh, if you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 49, we've been studying the servant passages, which are prophecies of the coming of Christ and what his work is going to be like. And we uh, got through uh, 49 verse 1 through 4 last week, and we're going to pick up where we left off. And I'd encourage you, uh, those of you in, uh, <clears throat> listening to us on radio and the internet, to go to our website, www.churchofchristpreaching.com, and look on there. There's eight pages of pictures of our Christmas pictures that we have uh, our feeding and our uh, clothing of people. And uh, there's 139 pictures on there, and we'd encourage you to, to look at those. But there's also, more important, there's over a thousand sermons, all kinds of written lessons. We downloaded a million seven hundred thousand written lessons last year. Isaiah chapter forty-nine, one of the, the blocks of the servant passages. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant. Jesus was born to be God's servant. We saw last week that he was going to be a prophet. <coughs> according to Deuteronomy 18, 15 and following. He's gonna be a priest according to Psalms 110, verse one and following. He's gonna be a king according to 2 Samuel 7, uh, verse 12 and following. And now we get the picture that he's gonna be a servant when he comes, a prophet, a priest, a king, and a now a servant. Now thus saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Jacob's just another name for Israel. Though Israel be not gathered, they were still dispersed by the time that Christ came uh, and was born. The uh, 10 lost tribes were still lost. Only a very smattering of, of those tribes ever survived. Uh, and they joined themselves to Judah. Yet I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord and my God shall be my strength. Christ is going to depend on God because God sent him. He's the word of God, and he's going to depend upon God. 
And he said, It is a like thing that thou should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mightest be my salvation to the ends of the earth. It's a light thing that God is going to give him in this new covenant. And this new covenant sacrifice, always remember that no covenant was ever instituted without the shedding of blood. And Christ is going to be the blood offering, the blood sacrifice for this new covenant that's coming. It is a like thing, <coughs> considering that the Messiah is God himself, deity in the flesh, that it's no small work for him just to redeem Israel. That would just be a small thing. But the result of his work will be that he will be a light to the Gentiles, and that's all of us, all the nations of the earth, that thou mightest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. How do you know that you're tracking these scriptures right, preacher? Make me prove it often. Well, if you turn to Acts chapter 13, verse 47, we see the apostle Paul quoting that very same verse and saying that we're tracking it right. We're just talking about Jesus. Acts 13, 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. So this gospel going forth to all the world is universal. It is going out to all the earth. And uh, that's the goal, and God will never be satisfied until every creature hears, every person has the opportunity to say yea or nay and hear. Isaiah 49, verse 8, Thus saith the Lord, In an acceptable time I have heard thee, and in a day of salvation I have helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people. Again, this concept that Christ is going to be the offering, the gift uh, offering, this, the sin offering for this new covenant, for a covenant of the people to establish the earth. God would have done away with the earth long ago if it wasn't for that. To cause to inherit the desolate heritages. And so that's what we've really done here. This church is supposed to be closed. And so we've inherited the old waste places, the desolate places, and we've caused it to bloom by doing one thing, well, doing two things, feeding the poor and preaching the gospel to all the world. God's blessed it. You know, we have a wonderful ladies' class downstairs for Sunday school. You know, William is teaching Sunday school here in the auditorium, but there's a ladies' class that's being taught right downstairs in the ladies' classroom, and I want you ladies to be aware of that. That if you uh, if you come and join yourself to that class, you'll get a you'll get a good study down there in that ladies' class, just like you get one here in Williams' class. He says, "An acceptable time I've heard thee. Today is the day of salvation." In Second Corinthians chapter six, verse two, Paul says. For he has said, I have heard thee in a time accepted. So Christianity, the dispensation of the cross and grace, is a accepted time. And in the day of salvation, I have succored thee. And behold, now is the accepted time. And now is the day of salvation. Why would you wait? Why would you put off your salvation? Why would you take a chance of croaking, of falling out dead, of something happening to you, why would you go on and wait and procrastinate? You know, it is, sometimes I think of people, it, it's like a little kid that lost a quarter and it rolled down a hole into the gutter and it just looks there and says, man, it went right down there. Why don't you make a decision? I mean, get down there and get it. You know, do something with your life. Now is the day of salvation. Don't put off salvation. How much does God love us? We can't even really understand or fathom it in our minds. He tells us in this same servant passage, Isaiah 49, verse 16, 750 years before Christ is ever born, behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands, O Israel. Thy walls are continually before me. 
God has graven us upon the palms of his hands. He has shed his blood, poured out his blood in, uh, in sacrifice in order to save us. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned. No man ever spoke like Jesus, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He waketh morning by morning, he waketh mine ear to hear as the learned. Christ spoke as no other man ever spoke. He taught as no other man ever taught. He taught as one having authority. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 5. The Lord has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheek to them that pluck off the hair, and I hid not my face from shame and spitting. This prophecy says that when the Messiah comes, this servant comes, he's going to give his back to the smiters, and so in Matthew 27, verse 26, it says, Then he, uh, Pilate, then, then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So Barabbas is now like a figure, a picture, a, a, a shadow of what we are. We're all the scapegoat. If you're a Christian... You're just exactly like the scapegoat that in Israel, on the Day of Atonement, they would take two lambs, they would shoot dice over them. <clears throat> One of them would be the sacrifice, and he would go into the temple and be bled and be the sacrifice. The other would be the scapegoat, and he would be taken out to the wilderness of sin and would be uh, 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 turned loose and so that's where we are. We have been taken to the wilderness of sin and turned loose. Are you going to act like sinners in this wilderness of sin? Or are you going to start putting on Christ and being like Him? God wants us to put on Christ and be like Him. I hid not my face from shame and spitting, the prophecy says. In Matthew 26, 66, what think ye? And they answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face and buffet him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? What a beating he put up with from little twerps. He put up with this kind of abuse in order to save our souls. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 7. For thus the Lord God will help me. Therefore I shall not be confounded. Therefore I have set my face like flint. Jesus is not going to be moved aside from the work that he's going to do. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Who let us stand together? Who is my adversary? Isn't that amazing? See, the name of the devil really means adversary. He is our adversary. He used to be able to accuse us before God until he murdered the Christ and got himself kicked out of heaven. He has no more ability to come before God to accuse us, to slander us. And so Jesus has no devil. He has no adversary. No man can accuse him of sin because he has never sinned. He is totally sinless. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold the Lord, God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? For they shall all wax old as a garment. The moth shall eat them up. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant? That's always been my problem. You know, I, I never had any problem believing. I've just had a problem obeying. Have y'all ever had any of those problems like that? I, I don't have any problem at all believing. But see, our word belief and the Bible word belief is not the same thing. Our word 
Faith, which is, is, is just synonymous with belief, our word faith really means faithfulness. We're not saved by faith alone. We're saved by faith coming to God in the appointed way, and that way leads to faithfulness. You've got to start living the Christian life, being faithful. Start putting aside some of the sins that you used to do and leaving them all behind and going on to faithfulness. Who that obeys the voice of his servant, let's start obeying the words of Jesus. That walketh in darkness and hath no light, let him trust, let him have faith. See, that's what... Faith is, is trust with reliance in God and in his word. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay or wait upon his God. You just wait because God is going to bring all of this to pass. And he tells us when he's going to do it. In Daniel 9, 24, he says 70 Sabbath years 70 times 7 or in 490 years are determined upon thy people, upon the Jews, and upon thy holy city. And now he's going to name three things. To finish transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. The death of Christ on the cross did those three things we're going to find out in our study today. That is the three things that Christ accomplished on the cross. He made finished transgression, he put an end to sin, and he made reconciliation for iniquity. And to bring in everlasting righteousness, if you're in the church and you're really a Christian, you're part of this everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint, that anoint is Messiah, and to Messiah, the most holy, who was the Jesus, the Messiah? He was the most holy. Who is the most holy? God. Who was Jesus? He was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14 of John 1 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He is deity. He is God. In uh, Daniel 9, verse 26, and after the three score and two sabbatical years, that's what weeks there means, shall Messiah be cut off. Daniel is given a prophecy, and he says it will be 483 years from the commandment to restore and re rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the prince, and so... 483 years from 457 B.C. comes up to 26 A.D., the very year that Jesus presented himself to John the Baptist, was baptized, received the Spirit that came and dwelt upon him and, and remained upon him, as we saw last week, and began his ministry. He preached for three and a half years. In the midst of the week, he's killed, and he causes the obligation and sacrifice in the temple to cease having any effect whatsoever. And after the, the 483 years, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. No, he died for me. I hope he died for you, but I know he died for me. But I hope he died for you too. I, he can, die, he can uh, be appropriated today, right now. All you have to do is come to him in the appointed way. You believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Put your faith and trust and confidence in God to save you. Repent of your sins. Confess Christ as Lord. Be baptized into Christ. Just do it all and become a Christian. Why don't you go all the way, all in? You know, it's just like a poker hand, table stakes, just push it all in, man, and be all in for God. You got a winning hand. Nobody ever that has the blood of Jesus Christ credited to them will be lost. Now, you can leave that blood of Jesus Christ anytime you want to, but you won't be lost if you keep trusting in it. 
And the people of the prince, Titus was a prince, Jesus was a prince, Jesus sent Titus, and the people of the prince shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, the temple, and the end thereof will be the flood that desolations are determined. Now in chapter 52, verse 13, I want to talk with you a minute about the book of Isaiah. Well, let's, let's get on over to 53 first. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. We'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com. There's a thousand sermons on there, all kinds of written lessons, YouTube videos, all kinds of links. You can study. You can go all over the world and study. We had 313,000 hits last year on our web, last month on our website. That's going to be almost 4 million this year. Just keeps growing and growing. 125 countries, the most we've ever had is 115. We had 125 countries last month. He'll be very high. High here in Hebrew means to rise up, to lift up, to be raised up from the earth. Christ is to be lifted up in the air. In John chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He's going to be lifted up on a cross. John 8, 28, Jesus said, And then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. In John chapter 12, verse 32, And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Thus he said, signifying what death he should die. Isaiah 52, 14, As many as were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Christ is to be beaten and abused more than any man. The physical appearance of Jesus during those terrible scenes of that holy week during which he was denied sleep, beaten unmercifully by a Roman scourge, marked, mocked some six times in all in tr kangaroo trials and hearings and kangaroo courts, crowned with a crown of thorns, tortured to death on the cross. He was compelled to carry until he fainted being slapped, struck in the face with a fist, a reed, reviled and spit upon. This was the time when his vestige was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. His physical beauty perished under this venomous and inhuman treatment of the Jews. Romans were involved in Satan who put him to death. 52.15 so shall he sprinkle, and the word there is really be sprinkle. It means to be here, to be there, to expectate with, with blood, to offer sacrifice like the work of a priest. When the priest went in every year on the Day of Atonement into the Holy of Holies, he would go in and sprinkle blood before him, confessing his sins and the sins of the people. It's a word that describes that. So shall he sprinkle, and Jesus is now our high priest, many nations, and kings shall shut their mouth at him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall consider. Many kings in that first century all heard and could considered the gospel. Very few obeyed it. A few did, but very few obeyed it. But they heard it, and they considered it, and they generally kill the prophet for telling them. Sprinkle many nations. The Hebrew word means to be cleansed with blood. The suffering servant is what we're going to study the rest of this lesson. The great, no passage like it in the Bible, Isaiah chapter 53. In 1947, a a shepherd boy 
a Bedouin shepherd boy was chasing a lost goat, trying to find a lost goat. There's a cave up on the side of the hill, and he threw a rock up in that cave, hoping to scare the goat out, and he heard a clink, clink, clink when it, when it hit in there. And so he says something must be up in there, and so he goes up and climbs up there, and he looks in this cave, and he finds jars, big storage jars, about this big around, and he took the top of the lid off one of those jars and a bunch of old leather, and so he didn't know what it was or what the value had any value, must be worth something, and so he got six big rolls of old leather scrolls, and he took them, and he took them home, and they had them about six months, and they tried to sell them to a shoemaker to make shoes out of it. A shoemaker bought them for a little or nothing, he took it into the uh, Greek Orthodox monastery in Jerusalem, the St. Mark's Monastery, and the, uh, one of the priests there recognized it as being ancient Hebrew, and so he bought those, and one of them, one of the six scrolls, the original six Dead Sea Scrolls, is called the St. Mark Isaiah Dead Sea Scroll, and it is one of the most famous scrolls. It's this entire book of Isaiah. This 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah is word for word, letter for letter, exactly like your Bible. It has 13 variant letters in the entire chapter from the Masoretic text, this ancient book, a thousand years older than any Bible that we ever had. How you've heard of it, people say, well, the Bible's been written and rewritten and copied and recopied, and so there's all kinds of mistakes in it. Now we've got one a thousand years older than the, than the oldest Bible, the Leningrad Codex from 1100 AD. We've got, a, uh, we've got a Bible, and actually Isaiah comes from around the second century BC. This copy of Isaiah comes from the second century, 200 years before Christ was ever born. We have a copy of this book. Those 13 letter differences, all but three letters, the word light, L-G-H uh, in Hebrew, Olam, this, that is the only difference in Isaiah 53 and our Masoretic text that you have in your Bible and this ancient scroll. But the word light had, had been in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, uh, we already knew about it. It was in the Septuagint and had been left out of the Masoretic text. And so every other difference was only uh, spelling, grammar, things of that nature. They used to use longer words of spelling in the second century B.C. than what they used in the, in the first century. As an example, we might have the word beginning. B-E-G-I-N-N-I-N-G. And so that double N there, by the, in 200 years, Hebrew had uh, developed to a point that it dropped that, that second N. And so they had shorter spelling for the same word. And so that counted as a variant. And so this, this scroll proves beyond any doubt whatsoever <laughs> that the word of God has been faithfully transmitted to us. Today, the Jews claim that this 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah is talking about the historical uh, uh, suffering of the nation of Israel, but it can't be true. In this chapter, the personal pronoun in Hebrew, who, is, uh, is used and translated he 18 times. It's translated his 13 times. It's translated him 10 times, which means that God used the personal pronoun for one person 41 times trying to convince us that this is going to be one person who comes in history that fulfills this prophecy and nobody else. Furthermore, these he can't be the people like the Jews claim because he's contrasted to the people in verse 8. 
This is the only chapter in the Hebrew Bible that the Jews do not read in the synagogue every year. It's said to cause too much controversy and they don't want to <coughs> have any uh, problem in falling out and any kind of controversy at all, especially do they not want to learn anything about Jesus Christ. If you'll uh, turn with me now to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who hath believed our report? In John chapter 12, verse 37 in the New Testament, John chapter 12, verse 37. Can you put that up, please? But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, so that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? Now John tells us that Isaiah 53 is talking about Jesus even though he had done many miracles, they still didn't believe. And to whom is the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah had said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, or be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory, and he spake of him in this 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah that we're fixing to read. Paul also quotes this verse in Romans chapter 10, verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, speaking about Jews. For Isaiah said, who hath believed our report? What report? Well, the report of Isaiah and all the prophets throughout history the report about Jesus Christ, the report of John the Baptist, the report of Christ's own words itself, the Jews refused to believe. In John 1.11 it says, And he came to his own, and his own received him not. Isaiah 53.1, the second half of that verse, Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? In Isaiah chapter 52, verse 10, we're told what that arm is. <coughs> it's always the saving power of God. Isaiah 52, 10, the Lord has laid bare his holy arm, the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. So what is the arm of the Lord that was revealed? Well, anybody who saw Jesus Christ if you were a, a standing and watching a triumphal entry and you saw Jesus ride by on a donkey, you saw the arm of the Lord. You saw the saving power of God. Even if you saw him just afar off, you saw the saving power of God. In Exodus chapter 6, we see that God has been involved with the arm of the Lord for a long time in saving his people. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgment. Isaiah 52, 2. For he shall grow up before him, before God, as a tender plant, and as a root out of the dry ground, he has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Before the father, he grew up as a tender plant. Isaiah had previously spoken about this in the 11th chapter, and he says there shall come forth a branch, a shoot, a rod, shall stand up out of the stem of Jesse. If you took an oak tree and you cut it down to the ground, that's what Israel was like, like a wilderness in a tree cut down to the ground. And so from that root system that's still in the ground will stand up a shoot and that tree will try to grow again. 
And that's exactly what Christ is. He shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. He is a representative of Israel. He's the only one that is worthy to represent Israel out of the stem of Jesse. And a branch shall grow out of his root. This root out of a dry ground refers to the corrupt nation of Israel and their age and the arid soil of mankind. Both the nation of Israel and all the nations in the pre-Christian Gentile world are pictured as dry ground. Notice the clause, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He's not going to be body beautiful like Zeus. We've been studying the book of Acts. We're going to go back to that next week. So you might read Acts 21. We'll be ready to study that. But uh, he's not going to be like Zeus and like Hercules, body beautiful. He's just going to be a common, ordinary man. He's going to look like any other human being. The Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews 2.14, for as much then as the children were partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver him through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bond. Any of y'all ever been afraid to die? Man, I'm telling you, I've been in roaring gun battles. It, it, it is terrifying. You might think that you're the bravest guy in the world. It is terrifying when you face death. I'm telling you, when you face death and it smiles at you, you can't do nothing but smile back. That's all you can do. He is despised, Isaiah 52.3. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid as if it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Notice the continuous action verb, is. He still is despised and rejected a man. People still do hide their faces from him. We hid our faces from him. This is prophesying of the apostles and how they run off in Mark 14, 50, and they all forsook him and fled. Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he has borne our griefs. Notice the repetition of the word our here. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. This is the heart of the gospel where we learn why Jesus suffered. <coughs> it was not for himself, but it was for us. And again, notice the emphatic use of the reoccurrence of the word I. It follows our griefs and our sorrows and our transgressions, our peace, our healing. All of that is the reason why. Christ Jesus accomplished our salvation all alone. His vicarious, which means separate and apart from us, righteousness and atoning death in which he sacrificed himself for our sins. We weren't involved in it. We didn't help. Nobody helped him. He did it all by himself. In Hebrews 1.3 the Hebrew writer tells us who being the brightness of his glory Jesus, the brightness of God's glory, splendor, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. Nobody else was involved in it. By himself purged our sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. There's that word Daniel had said, transgressions, sins, and iniquities. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement, the punishment, the spanking that we deserve, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we're here. Right here is the vital heart of Christianity. The case of Adam's race was hopeless. 
We had all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The penalty of sin is death, and the justice of God requires that the penalty be paid. Otherwise, all the human race would have been lost forever. But there was no one who could pay it. What was the salvation? God himself stepped into human form, into the human race, in the person of his son, and paid the penalty for our sins on the cross. With his stripes, he was scourged, we are healed. Remember again, Matthew 27, 26, then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. How do you know this is talking about Jesus? Well, Peter tells us it is in 1 Peter 2, uh, uh, verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree. I'm sure glad he bore my sins and that and paid for all of them. You know, we don't get away with nothing. Christ paid for all our sins. That we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye are healed. There he is quoting Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5 again. Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray and turned everyone to his own way. Now this is called a parallelism in, uh, in literature. All we on one hand, and everyone on the other hand, and they balance, a parallelism must balance. All people are sinners. Every one of us have turned to our own way. All we like sheep have gone astray. Sheep are the most Wandering off, bunch of people, I tell God all the time, you didn't give me sheep, you gave me cats. It's like trying to herd cats down here, trying to shepherd anything to do with this congregation. <laughs> all we like sheep have gone astray and turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. All people are sinners. And Christ's sacrifice was good enough for all the sins of the whole wide world. In Romans 3, uh, 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They've all gone out of the way, and they are together become unprofitable. And there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Our fall was so far down that no matter what we do, we are separated from God by such a great, great distance that even our good works are flawed. They must come through the blood of Christ to be acceptable to God. I can give a person a sandwich, and uh, all I've done is give them a sandwich. But if Jesus gave them a sandwich, he would have changed their life forever. They'd have never been the same. It's not the same. We can't do perfect righteousness. We can try, and we can try to be better, but we'll never achieve perfection until we croak. That's when we'll achieve perfection. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, can you put that up, please? 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. And he is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. His sacrifice was so powerful that it could save everybody who's ever lived if they put their faith and trust and confidence into Christ and come to him in the appointed way. Verse uh, 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Notice the silence in face of the accusers, the mockers, and the judges of many tribunals which he was arraigned. Pilate said, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and power to release thee? Isaiah 53, 7 again. He has brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as sheep 
before his shears is done. This is an ag agricultural simile based on a truth that a goat slaughtered in a traditional manner responds with blood clearing uh, cries. A goat will scream and carry on when you cut his throat and you hear it a mile away. But a sheep submits to the butcher's knife silently. The same phenomena occurs when both animals are sheared. Goats raise all kinds of cane and sheep put up with it. Jesus submitted to the outrages uh, perpetuated against himself, offering no more resistance than a lamb either sheared nor slaughtered. Would you please put up Hebrews 12, verse 3. In Hebrews 12, verse 3, the Hebrew writer tells us, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. It was a great contradiction. He was God in the flesh, and he let these little pumps, these little twerps, push him around and kill him. It is a great contradiction. Why would God do that? I have trouble, man, putting up just with a smart mouth. Why in the world would God do that? I'm not kidding you. I have trouble putting up with people with a smart mouth. I fly off the handle, man. Why? My God, they tried to do that to me, and I was God. I'd turn them into mush. I mean, seriously, why would God put up with such contradiction of sinners against himself? It was a great contradiction. Then the Hebrew writer tells us, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds, speaking about us giving up and giving in to sin. And this word faint in your minds means show the palm. And so in boxing in those days, these guys, they beat themselves, they beat them down, and you could kick, you could punch, you could do anything in fighting, in boxing, but you couldn't bite. You couldn't bite. But you, anything other than that, man, you could knee them, you could get them when they're down, you could stomp them, you could do anything in fighting. And when you beat them down, if they couldn't show the palm, you beat them to death. And so all you had to do in, in boxing in the Olympics was just show the palm. Just say, Jiggers, I've had it, man. You whoop me, I've had it. And so the fight was over. You were the winners, like throwing in a towel in the boxing ring today. And the Hebrew writer is telling us that you haven't boxed sin to the shedding of blood, you haven't beat your, you haven't been beat down by the devil. The devil did not make you drink that beer. The devil did not make you take that cocaine. The devil tempted you with it, but he didn't beat you down and make you take it. You freely chose to take it. He just offered it. He just dangled it out there like a, a minnow on the end of a hook, and you went for the okie doke shows the meekness and submission which Christ suffered in this violent and unjust death of his. All right, preacher, prove it. How do you know Isaiah is talking about Jesus? Well, one of the first conversions that is listed fully in the book of Acts is in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch. So the Ethiopian eunuch is reading from this same 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah, and so we'd encourage you to uh, look at Isaiah, uh, excuse me, Acts chapter 8, and we're going to drop down to verse 28 for time's sake, was running and sitting in his chariot, and he was read Isaiah the prophet. And then said the Spirit to Philip, Go join thyself near him, down to verse 32. And the place of the scripture which he read was this, he's led as a sheep to the slaughter, that's what we've been reading now, Isaiah 53, 7, he's led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is done before he shears, so he opened not his mouth, and in his humiliation and judgment he was taken away, and who shall declare his generation, for his life was taken from the earth, and the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man. 
And Philip opened his mouth and began at that same scripture and preached unto him Jesus, and that's what I'm trying to do to you today. <coughs> I'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com. Isaiah 53, 8. He's taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. I want you to notice he's killed in verse 8. The prophet says that he'll be killed in verse 8. He'll be buried in verse 9. He'll be killed in verse 8. He's taken from prison and from judgment. And the prison is Matthew 27, 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall that was the prison and gathered in him the whole band of soldiers. And he's taken from judgment, and that's the name of the very seat that Pilate sat in in Matthew 27, 19. And when he, Pilate, was set down in the judgment seat. Isaiah 53, verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. Daniel 9 verse 26 said, And after this 483 years shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. No, he died for me. Verse 9, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. This is one of the most amazing prophecies. The significant fact of the word wicked here is used in the plural form in the Greek, and the rich man is used in the singular form in the Greek, excuse me, in the Hebrew, and the Greek in the New Testament. They made his grave with the wicked to be crucified between two thieves, Matthew 27, 38, and then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Verse 9, they made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. This be buried in a rich man's tomb, in Matthew 27, verse 57. And when the evening was come, they came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He was a rich man from Arimathea. And he went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. Isaiah 53.10. He's killed in verse 8. Buried in verse 9 in a rich man's tomb. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his what? See. We've been studying this for two weeks. What does that mean? It means his child. God will see his child, his only begotten son, and do what? Prolong his days. How do you prolong somebody's days when you kill them in verse 8? You bear them in verse 9. How do you prolong her gaze in verse 10? The only way to do it is raise him from the dead, right? He shall see his seed and prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He made his soul an offering from sin, dronepsh. The soul is frequently used in Hebrew to signify his life. Throughout the New Testament, the salvation of men have, uh, has been attributed to the death of Christ. God will see his child and prolong his days. We saw this in prophecy all the way from the very, very beginning of the book. Let's drop down to um, uh, Isaiah 53, 11. He will see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Now in this verse, this is the only place in Isaiah chapter 53 that there is a difference in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the Masoretic text. And here the word light is added. He shall see the travail of his soul and see light. 
God saw light at the death of Christ for the first time in all of history. Every man that ever died showed nothing but darkness and sin when he died. But when Christ died, God saw light, saw purity. He will see the prevail of his soul and see light and shall be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. God wants you to be involved in Christ, verse 12, Isaiah 53, 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul into death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Won't you let him bear your sins? Won't you let him make intercession for your transgressions? Won't you let him wash all your sins away? If you're here this morning and you believe the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you just march down to the front right here and make confession that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Repent of your sins. Confess Christ as Lord. Be baptized into Christ. If you have sin in your life, won't you come now while we stand and sing?